What's going on, junkies? Thanks for joining us again for another multifamily Monday. We've got a pretty awesome uh, guest here for you today, and, and he's got a pretty awesome story. So uh, we're excited to get started. Uh, I'm just going to let Will introduce uh, our guest for today. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Brandon. You're not going to tell everybody to go subscribe or no, uh, no. If, a, if, if by now you're not listening on, or if you're not a member on Facebook and, <laughs> and telling friends, then you're doing it all wrong. So. <laughs> That's funny. Well, today on the show, we have Reed Goosens. Uh, Reed is the host of the podcast called Investing in the U.S. He's a best-selling author, published a few books, and he's the co-founder of Wildhorn Capital. And he's done some awesome stuff in the multifamily space. If you're, if you're learning about the multifamily space or you're in the multifamily space, you've probably heard of Reed Goosens before. So with that, Reed, thanks so much for coming on our show. Can you just give the listeners a little bit more about your background and what got you to where you are today? Yeah, well, first of all, boys, thank you very much for having me. I, I know I had the pleasure of interviewing you, Will, on my show. So, yeah. uh, and, and you as well, Brandon. Did, were you on there as well? I can't remember. I was not, though. No. We'll have to get you on there. Maybe it was some other bald guy with a beard. Yeah, who like somewhere Brandon. on there. There's a lot <laughs> of people that end up <laughs> looking like me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah but no, thanks, thanks, lads, for having me on. Look, yeah, I think I've, I've drummed this beat to, 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 to the nth degree um yeah i'm originally from australia and, and moved out to the united states in 2012 and, and really came here with a drive and a passion to to live as an expat um in the united states in the big in the big apple in new york city and um my whole mission and my whole journey is to to inspire other people and if i can move halfway across the world quit my job in australia well-paying job in australia and move here with limited funds you know established network i didn't go to school here i don't have you know, family here and if I can achieve financial freedom and sort of, I've done it in seven years uh, through US real estate, um, if I can do it and if an Aussie can do it, then, then so can people listening to this show. So the whole message hopefully from today is that if you're sitting on the fence, get the hell off the fence and get started. So, so yeah, well, that's, that's, that's true. That was pretty good. We, we, we could just end the episode right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> a two, a little five minute episode. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so, so, so when, when, you, when you came here or prior to coming here, just tell us how you made the decision and what did you do to prepare for that? Yeah, so, so my, uh, if I rewind the clock right back, so my background's in structural engineering. I went to school for structural engineering. I'm a qualified uh, structural engineer, got honors in, in engineering. Um, I'm actually a chartered structural engineer, which is a title that they give a, uh, what they call class here is a PE, a professional engineer. It's the same, same sort of um, accreditation, but in Australia. Um, and so when I graduated in 2007, I moved to the United, uh, to the United Kingdom, London, um, to work as a structural engineer on the 2012 Olympic Games, all the infrastructure that was being built in 20, 2008. Obviously, oh, wow. That's awesome. That's cool. It doesn't, it doesn't just you know, snap. Right. right. So, so my, my first job was, was in, in, in London and, and it was exciting. It was living in a new country. I was an expat. You know, I could run the rat race whilst living in a new country. Um, we did that for a bit over 18 months and my visa was only very limited. And then in 2009, I wasn't ready to go home and I went to the south of France and I became a deckhand. Uh, if you've ever seen the show Below Deck on Bravo, uh, it is exactly that. And I was working for the, the Russian billionaires uh, working as a deckhand on the south of France. During that time, I met my then, then girlfriend, now wife, Erica, who's American. Oh, nice. Congrats. And one of the whole reasons of coming to, thank you, coming to the United States was we fell in love with this girl. We fell in love, we met each other on the beaches of Spain and San Sebastian. And then I went back to work on the boat. She went back to her life. I crossed the Atlantic Ocean on this boat, went backpacking through New York City at the end of 2009, early 2010, fell in love with New York City, went to LA on my last stop back to Australia, you know, met up with her. She was freaking awesome. She then told me, Hey, I'm uh, I'm coming to Australia to do my masters in 2011. Like, you know, we we, we should uh, we should totally date. And we, so we did long distance for a year, and but then going back to Australia after having those two years of abroad, 09, sorry, 08, 09, and a bit of 010, back at my engineer, back in a engineering job uh, in in Australia, I just was like, oh my gosh, I had the best two years of my life. I can't believe that I am back here sitting in a cubicle, and that was really the first time where I was like. I wouldn't say it's not the, the word depressed is not the right word. It's just I needed a, an alternative knowing that I could see my future of, geez, I could be sitting here for the next 40 years of my life in this one cubicle. Yeah, it's a pretty had, awful thought. So it was just kind yeah, of an awakening. I knew, it was an awakening. I, I, I knew I had more to give. I felt like 
and I always, I've never played basketball, but I always, I always thought of I, the, the basketball image comes to mind when you're sitting on the bench mm-hmm. and the game's going in front of you, right? And just that was for what life felt like. I was like, this can't, I love studied engineering. I loved, you know, the, the problem solving ability it gave me in, in terms of my cognitive thinking, but it was just so limiting in terms of, oh, this is it. This is what I'm going to do. So anyway, at that point, wow. picked up the book Rich Dad Poor Dad in 2010, and that was that was the start. That was the aha. Someone can pay me to live my life, and it doesn't have to be a, a you know they call it a W two job here in Australia. They call it something else, but you don't have to have it. You don't have to have a job, and that is the journey where the journey started. And just so happened that I took the blink. That book took the blinkers off in terms of. Well, I'm a structural engineer. I'm already working with developers and building infrastructure and doing some cool projects. So maybe I just need to change my mindset about where I'm actually working in a day job and start rubbing shoulders with developers. Um, and so from there, I was like, started to go to local real estate events in Australia, um, was saving some money, going to do something in Aussie, you know, like a lease option or a flip. Um, and then in two, Erica came out and she studied for a year. And at the end of 2011, really had this drive and passion to want to move back to the United States, want to be an, an expat, wanted to live in New York City. And I just said, screw it, let's go. Let's, let's give it a crack. Um, she was obviously American, so she could. it was easy for her. The, the visa situation for me was a little bit more difficult. But if I had a job, or if I could find a job, I would get a visa. So the coming to America story was really like, New York City, let's go, let's give it a crack. Let's, um, you know, the, the idea was like, let's just go there for a couple of years and, and we'll figure it out from there. That was nothing, nothing more than that. And, and the whole thing was like, even if I come back to Australia, the worst case scenario is I'll just get another engineering job and, and and, and, you know, go back to working. Right. And, and, and I was that experience and, and knowledge. Know, well, I was still working as a, as a structural engineer in New York City. Don't get me wrong. I, when I first moved there, I literally listed out on an on a A4 piece of paper, back to front, all the engineering joints I could Google firms in New York City. And I tried to aim for people who, or companies that were less than 30 employees, because if they had less than 30 employees, they wouldn't have HR. And HR is the gatekeeper, right? And they would see that, oh, my resume is a, He's an Aussie or he's, you know, he got an education in not in America. Um, quickly did I realize that New York City is a boiling pot of multiculturalism and that everyone, you know, w- w- is from somewhere else. So um, I, w- I went knocking on doors and I just knocked and knocked and knocked and knocked and knocked until someone said yes, got the visa, was able to stay. And then from there, it was like, oh, now I can start going to New York real estate invest, you know, investment associations. And that was like a fire hose of information compared to where I come from. So long-winded story, but that is how the coming to America, the whole idea of going from a gallivanting around Europe in the world to coming back to Australia, falling in love, picking up the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, wanting to change my life, giving it a go here in the United States. And and we can talk more about how it evolved over the last seven years. So yeah. Yeah. Well, the first thing I want to say is you're really lucky because you have an accent. Clearly (laughs) that's why you got your, uh, your wife, I assume she's like, Oh, this Australian guy's got this great accent. (laughs) Me and Brandon don't have that. So I'm I'm a little envious. I'll time out a little bit on on a side (laughs) note from that. I, we met on the beaches of Spain and and because in Spain, I thought, um, I thought, Oh, these girls are looking at us and we're like, I bet you they speak Spanish, man. Like, and one with two other Aussie guys, I'm like, I can't speak a lick of Spanish, you know. And so it turns out that like one of my mates went up to him and they're like, "We're from Southern California." Like, well, boom. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Oh, we man, speak that's, English. That's too. hilarious. <laughs> that, that kind of it sounds like a like a love story book, you know? Yeah. Like, oh, exactly. I was working here and uh, doing all this. And oh that's, man, that's, cool. that's it's cool. a cool story. It's a cool story, man. I'm not yeah. gonna lie. We, we, yeah. we, but we only got married two years ago, so it was like really lovely to come to the United States have a job, have a visa, not be having to force to get, you know, married for a green card and just let the uh, relationship evolve, which was, I'm lucky in that sense where a lot of people who are, you know, two foreigners or you know, from different countries, they've got to like force that marriage uh, question. Yeah. Yeah. I had, a, I had a buddy do that. Three, that was three years ago and they're now divorced. So, I mean, <laughs> yeah, that's, I, I totally get that. Work out, right? time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so it's, it sounds like you came here, you came to New York and mm-hmm. you got a job, you knew it wasn't going to be, it was, it was more just kind of pay the bills type of thing. Right. Exactly. And mm-hmm. allow you basically hold you over while you figured out what you were going to do. So mm-hmm. t- with that, where, what did you start doing? How did you eventually get to multifamily? Yeah, so the, the, the whole thing started was when I first moved to the United States, the, the infrastructure of education with the, re, the REARS, and you know, you know about the REARS, the Real Estate Investment Association, yeah. 
that we have a little bit of that in Australia, like not like like three <laughs> Brisbane, Sydney, and oh, Melbourne. Wow. Like it's not, it's not as prevalent and as well funded and as well uh, organized, and, and particularly New York City, like it's millions and millions of people. So it's going from like call it country Australia, even though it's not you know country Australia to the Big Apple. It was just it was I was blown away at just the amount of resources that you could get from these associations for paying 20, 30 bucks to go listen to some speakers and get some really great information. Um, so that was sort of the, 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 the perspective coming from Australia. Then quickly realizing, oh my gosh, you can buy properties for really dirt cheap. And, you know, I, and I found, you know, Syracuse, New York is where I, I sort of, I, I had a bit of money saved and I could get there on the Greyhound bus on a weekend um, and I could just get started. Right. And so the whole rich dad, poor dad thing is like, put money in your pocket and it was, you know, let's, let's look at multifamily. And I, I started with the $38,000 triplex in upstate New York and in uh, what I quickly learned was a ghetto. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and, and so that, that was really the, st I knew I want to get started multifamily. It was just what I, what, what, what resources did I have at that stage and figuring out what a credit score was and what's an LLC. So I had sort of had to retrain my brain sure. to, to understand how to go and just do it to all the, the mechanisms of buying real estate here as of, technically a foreigner because I was only fresh off the boat, but I bought that property within, I think six months of, of being in the United States and go, you know, understand guys that when you pick up the book, Rich Dad Poor Dad in early 2010, it's now late 2012. It's sort of been two and a half years of a lot of education and, and, right. and knowing that I needed to pull the trigger. Like it was, I remember like sitting on the train, you know, on the subway in New York, reading my nose in a book about, you know, understanding how to analyze deals and all that sort of stuff. And just, Realizing that you know, you know, you don't lose weight by reading about going to the gym. You go to the freaking gym, right? So yep. yeah, get, go to the get get going, get get your first okay. deal done, and that's really that that's what happened. That, that's the start of, of that. So yeah, how did how did you find that first? How did you find that triplex? Yeah, look, it was just honestly, I didn't have a car in New York City, so I was getting on the Greyhound bus like once a month or once you know every two weeks and going up to Syracuse, New York was, it was just a, a, a town that I could afford, right? It was just, New York city yeah. is like Australia. It's high barrier entry, you know, you know, no cash flow. Um, so chose Syracuse, but for the, the, the fact that it was good locale and at a university, that was really it. Then just started going up there and pestering brokers and they used to swing by and pick me up from, um, from the Greyhound bus station. And we'd just go cruising around and learn in the area. And I probably did three or four little trips and then found a place. It was uh, 512 Fabius Street in Syracuse, New York. If any of those listeners are from Syracuse, you can swing by it and check it out. <laughs> check it out. Uh, yeah. That's amazing. And, and that's, that, that's, that's, that's got how it got started. And, and that, I had to pay all cash for it because it was, I didn't have any lending abilities. I was just about to ask that. How, yeah, being no six lending. months over here, how, how yeah. did you? So I had, I, you know, well, before making that decision to come to the United States, I had had saved some money just through working a, an engineering job. I was working mm -hmm. in the mines and it was well paid. And, you know, again, I was doing, going to do something in Australia, but it was all my own cash that I saved over a period of about, you know, 12 to 18 months. I was very frugal after coming back from traveling abroad, um, just about saving money. And I think I had about 50 grand saved, but then, you know, becoming the United States, you lose a little bit of that because of exchange, but also sure. just cost. And then, so I had like, Thirty or forty thousand dollars left over of my own money, and I was like, "Well, let's get started." You know, it's my money; um, I can risk it, and I want to risk it. So, um, and that's that's how I got started. From there, created a, uh, a a relationship with First Niagara Bank. If anyone knew, knows or has heard yeah. of that bank, uh, that oh, was a bank. Not me. <laughs> yeah, that was a bank back in the day, and and it was just a, a local relationship, and was depositing checks over a period of six months, and and then I got a line of credit for about thirty thousand dollars and bought deal number two. Um, so it was just a, a slow and steady first couple of years. Um, then I, I bought a house in Philadelphia that I flipped, um, also all whilst working full time in New York city and, and trying to have a, a good couple of years in New York. So, so yeah. So you were just, you, you were just kind of a, a, a real estate junkie. You were just looking for deals and, uh, did, did that take up most of your spare time when you weren't yeah. working? Yeah, hundred like percent. Yeah. It was, it was it was playing rugby on the weekend with the yeah. boys, you know, having live in New York City and as you know, burning the candle at both ends, working a day job and just learning, 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 building spreadsheets, understanding, you know, just trying to get money to become financially free. And, and the, the whole, the second aha moment in my life was at the end of 2013, 
had a couple, had two little properties in upstate New York. I had just bought this place in, in, in Philly. We were, we were gonna, it was a row house. We we're going to put a, a third level on it. Um, and my buddy came down from Canada and he's like, I went out for a beer and we'd studied engineering in Australia. And he, I was telling him, I was boasting about, oh, I've got a couple little properties and doing this thing and crushing it. And he's like, good on you, man. That sounds freaking awesome. Uh, he just, he goes on to tell me he closed on a 70, you know, seven zero, 70 unit deal. And I was like, how the hell did you do that? And he told me about, you know, obviously the power of other people's money, the power of having a mentor, the power of seller carryback financing, you know, all these things I've been learning about. So you didn't and, raise any money up to that point. No, no, no money, no money. Was I think all yeah, everything was yours. Wow, that's impressive. Yeah, my, I think my dad helped me with the flip, but that was like I was like, Dad, I'll promise you, I'll give you. It's really a promissory note. I'll give you fifteen percent return on your money. Um, and okay. I actually, I actually lost money on that deal, and we can get into that if you want. Oh, really? But um, but I, but it was a good forte into giving investors what you promised. Um, but back to the the whole the the, the aha moment it was like. I was implementing the strategies he was doing just on my smaller stuff. You know, I had five, six units in upstate New York. I was going in spending five, ten thousand dollars a unit, jacking the price of the rent by a hundred, hundred and fifty bucks a month. But because it was on resi, you know, smaller than four, it wasn't really moving the needle in terms of NOI. Right. And then, you know, he was doing exactly the same strategy, but on 70 units, coupled with OPM, other people's money, coupled with mentorship. And at that specific time in the end of 2013, I knew I was getting to the, 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 the end of my tether from borrowing. I was doing it all kind of myself, self-education. I've been pitched a ton of, you know, 30, 40, $50,000 courses that you can do. But I knew I had to get that mentor who, you know, I just needed that coach to take me to that next level. And that's, that was early, uh, late 2013 and early 2014, got a coach, actually moved to LA at that point. Who was the coach? Uh, he was Joe Fellis. It was, oh, uh, nice. I was, I was one of my, I was one of his first ever students and he'd only done one deal at the time. And I think it was 2,500 bucks. Like I was very, fr again, very frugal with who I was going to get signed up with, right. but it was That's the probably the 2,500 bucks you've ever spent though. Well, yeah, yeah. Look, I helped Joe as much as he helped me. You know, like right. I introduced him to Frank, which is now his business partner at Ashcroft Capital. They're doing really, really well. Oh, wow. I love all their success. So it was, it was a bit of a, a two way street. Also, he'd only done one deal. It wasn't like he was 30 years worth of experience. It was just the mm. fact that it was cheap. <laughs> and yeah. it was the fact that I parted away with 2,500 bucks and then had a sounding board to, that was probably the most beneficial, that sounding board of someone who wasn't my own self conscious, right? right. My own look at myself in the mirror. It was someone who I could hate. Hey man, think about this. Yeah, go do it. Okay, cool. You know, like, yeah, was, a second set of eyes, basically. Second, the second set of eyes, um, you know, and, 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 and Joe, it, that was, it allowed me to the permission to invest in myself. And that was what the parting way of 2,500 bucks did. And then obviously got Joe to be just a sounding board of what idea, bouncing ideas off one another. And that's really what a mentor should be. And, and obviously Joe's gone on to become a peer of mine. Um, and he's you know awesome dude. I'm actually going to his conference here in, uh, in the Feb where we're sponsoring it. So I think I'm actually spending more on the bloody sponsorship than I ever spent on him. So <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but, it, but, but it's, it's the, the, the crux of it is for those people listening, it was, I gave myself permission to invest in myself. And that was the most important thing. Instead okay. of taking 2,500 bucks to go try and buy another property or do something with it. I was like, no, I need a, I need a coach. So yeah. And, okay. So and, yeah on that topic real quick for somebody sitting there debating, you know, whether or not they should spend a few grand on, on getting that mentor. What, I mean, I, I kind of know your answer, but what would you tell them? Oh yeah. It's, it's literally, it's, you're going to have many mentors over the years and Joe, Joe and I worked together for a couple of years and he, you know, we're obviously now peers and, and equals and lots of great stuff. Um, and I've got, I've had many mentors since then, um, different types of mentors as well. It, you, you know, rest in peace, Kobe, you know, the, the Kobe's of the world, the LeBron James's, um, you know, they all have coaches to be the best at what they do. Mm -hmm. You as, a, as an engineer, as an entrepreneur, need to understand that you to be the best or to strive to be your better self, you're going to need someone on your team that can be that sounding board, that can be that look over the shoulder, that can be that guiding light to help you give you the confidence to go off and do more and be better. Hey man, that's so true. You yeah. know, you just can't, you don't have all the information up in your no, head no. to do it alone. Like you, like no. you, I mean, I, I look at, 
uh, you talking to that guy that said he was doing a 70 unit, you, you probably at that time couldn't even fathom that. It's like, well, how, couldn't, how, couldn't fathom it, but, but I could fathom it. Like, ah, it's just there. Like, it's just over that. Yeah. Hill. Like rise. I've been hearing it. I've been hearing about this OPM and, and, you know, seller carryback finance and, and syndication. Right. I just didn't, I could like seeing someone in my inner circle who was a good mate of mine. It was like, Oh, he can do it. I can bloody do it. Right, <laughs> exactly. So, you know, I've, I've already moved halfway across the bloody world. This next step's easy. You know what I mean? So it was it, totally, it, it's, it was just one foot in front of the other and one opportunity. And, and I know this question is going to come up in the future is like, what do you reckon? What's, you know, what's going to happen in your future? And it was like, it's those moments in life that a door opens and you have to be malleable enough. You have to be uh, grounded enough. You have to be self-aware enough to walk through those bloody doors and knowing that you don't know what's going to be behind that door. But as long as you walk through it, you, you're going to find out. You're going to find out. That's right. And, that, and that's all that. And you, you know, that conversation could have gone nowhere and a lot of people would have done nothing with it. Yeah. I, I happen to have done something with it. Taking me years to get like a lot of freaking hard work where i'm today but i was I, I was big enough and ugly enough to walk through that bloody door that's so, well kudos yeah. to you for taking action after hearing something like that that's yeah. good stuff what so at that point when you wrote before you got started or right when you got started with joe fairless you had not done any big deals you had only done the ones on your own uh, and you mentioned that the flip lost money before mm-hmm. i ask this question real quick how, how did that <laughs> what happened there uh, it really came boiled down to ARV. Uh, ARV, ARV and timing. And when I say ARV, uh, after repair value, we bought the property, uh, or me and my, um, my then business partner, just a, another expat that we just bought for $110,000. I did the structural engineering drawings for the third. It was a two story row house on the, on the, on the end, but everything in the row was three stories. So we knew we could go up a third story. Uh, we just we we underestimated a little bit the cost. We thought it was going to cost us about 200 G's, so 110 in, uh, 200 G's in in renovations and holding costs, and we we thought we could sell it for about 400. Came down to poor choice of general contractor. Had to fire the general contractor. He stole a bunch of stuff. We essentially yeah. GC the rest of it. Um, but at, at the end of the day, it sold really quickly. I think it sold for like 480 or 490, like lots like that. Oh, wow. But the holding period, when you underwrite to six or seven months, you know, maximum 12 months, when that blows out to 18 months, when he didn't get sign off from the city, so we had to go back to the city, open up walls and all that sort of stuff, it's just a function of time, a function yeah. of money. Um, and then so thus, I had my dad had invested a little bit of money in it. We got a construction loan. Um, and, and look, he, I made my dad whole and I gave him his 15% on his money, which I promised him. I lost a little bit of money on that, but I didn't lose my shirt. And it was a good reminder of, you know, just even I was doing this as a day day to day job as a structural engineer managing GCs. The the big clarity was that in the resi space, no offense, GCs can be a little bit shoddy. Uh, when you go in the commercial space, they're just a little bit more professional. I think shoddy um, is putting it nicely. <laughs> yeah, so particularly in <laughs> Philly, when you're trying to get something done for like in Philly, you know, back in 2013 and and, and even today. 150 Gs, 200 thousand dollars is a lot to add to a 110 thousand dollar property. Yeah, it is. So, yeah. You know, it's not, this is not, we didn't underestimate budgetary things. It was just screw ups, excuse my language, fuck ups for BC that we essentially had to take it over at the end. And and, and luckily through the skills of my day job, working with cities and municipalities in LA, in New York, understanding how, um, you know, uh, uh, inspectors work, calling them up, getting my Aussie accent on, oh, please, you know, get on, you know, we're doing all right. the right things here. We've got the plans, you know, we, we, we definitely got it all approved. My GC screwed up along the way. We want to rectify it. How do we work together to get this over the line? That's, oh, the that's cool. of, those, those problem solving skills that, that I, I learned from my day job being a structural engineer. That yeah. Maybe someone in, in, who wasn't that type of experience would have, you know, panicked and, 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 and essentially handed the keys back to the bank. Well, that, that's great. You didn't lose your shirt. And I'm sure you got a ton of valuable experience that you've um, carried forward from that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so back to my original question, were you, when you got, when you got started with Joe Fairless and you were starting to learn about syndication and, and all of that, were you financially free at that time no, from the, pro- no, 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 not at all. No, I near it. Like okay. I, no, no. I, so the, 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 the overarching story is in 2014 moved to LA I think I got a job, again, did the same thing, pound of the pavement, pound of the pavement, got an engineering job, found an engineering joint in LA, 
um, used the uh, one of my cubicle buddies, a younger fellow, I handed him the book Rich Dad Poor Dad over a weekend one time. He came back to work on the Monday. And he's like, man, I'll do anything for you. And I was like, anything? He's like, yeah. I was like, get all the emails of all the developers you work with in LA on the current projects and send them to me so I can email them. And, and so I, I wanted, I, I said, if I've got to continue in this job, and remember, I didn't have a W, I didn't have a green card at this point. So I still had to have the job right. in order to stay in the country. And so what I did was I, he gave me some emails. I re, I was literally blind emailed everyone. And I knew that I was like, screw engineering, screw this. I, I don't give a flying book about the, the bolts in the connection that holds a column to the floor joists. <laughs> right. uh, I wanted to know how much you rent in the bloody space for. Uh, and so I thought, well, I've got a skill set here that I can go be valuable to a, a ground up developer. And I, I transitioned and I went and became a, a, an owner's rep in early 2000, mid of 2014 and was, was and worked with them for three years uh, with, um, uh, and again, Joe was, uh, we didn't, we stopped working together in 2015. We're doing a few little deals. Like I was co GP with him, um, but started to do my own deals. And it wasn't until 2017, uh, to, middle of 2017, I got, I became financially free after I got married. So oh, wow. yeah, it was so, so the, what I, but the lesson there is I had a skill set and I pivoted. And if I, if I had to keep a W2 job, stay, you get paid to learn if you can. And that's what I did. I went and became a, a ground up. Like I know all about ground up development uh, now. And, and that is where the big dogs play, you know, existing yeah. multifamily, putting lipstick on a pig. That's great for, for little guys, but you would never have heard of the people I've worked with. And they are, they are in half of Beverly Hills, you know, and wow. they don't have a podcast, they don't have a book, they don't have any of that sort of stuff that is, they're, they're big dogs and they, they know how to freaking run a city. So, uh, and they know, crazy. they know how to develop. So I come from that world of, yeah, like, but I had that mindset of like, I need, if I'm going to stay, if I need to keep the, the lights on and the roof over my head and the bills paid, I need to surround myself with real estate, real estate, real estate, 24 seven yeah. day job. I totally, I totally agree with that. That's, that's really cool. So you, I mean, you, you're changing a lot of stuff here. You moved, you got that new, I mean, you basically, made a career change yeah, at a that whole point. new life i mean yep. well, yeah but, but but understanding that i had a skill set that was valuable to someone else yeah right? right being a structural engineer and telling my story a little bit like guys i'm done with this this, this industry but and, and, and remember that little guy who was who was my sort of minion they were the, the developer was already using the structural engineering company to do the drawings and the structural engineering on their ground up construction and so the oh, deal wow. the the projects that he was working on, I ended up taking over as the owner's rep and building, I think, 400 high-end luxury uh, multifamily apartments. In no kidding. Beach. Oh, man. So you probably so, learned a ton from that. The, like, yeah, the whole business. How to, yeah. You know, it, it was too, and a lot of other more issues with general contractors. Even in the commercial industry, you have issues and suit, lawsuits and suing cities. It's just like, it's just a big, it's just a big game and, and more's on the line. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was, I definitely was in the trenches for a couple of years and, and yeah, so it's, it's, it's been, it's been a very awesome learning experience. That's so, great. Yeah. Well, you mentioned that you had co GP a few deals. I assume your raises capital had some other responsibilities. Yep. Uh, what was your, tell us about the first deal that you did on your, where you were the lead sponsor. Yeah. So the lead sponsor had done three deals with Joe and Frank, um, uh, in 2000 and was it 14, 15? And, and how much were you able to raise on those deals? Like the first ever deal, which was the Wood Glen in Houston. I probably shouldn't be saying the name of it, but anyway, it's the first deal that Frank uh, Rosler, the now the CEO of, of Ashcroft, and he was still working for, for a firm at the time. Um, he had found it and we'd become buddies here in LA and this was still working with Joe and and I was like, hey, Joe, you know, like, you should definitely look at this deal. It's a really good deal. And Joe's like, no, 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 I don't want to look at it. And I went, went back to him and said, hey, Joe, no, you should definitely look at this deal. It's a seven cap, mate. You know, like, get, get yeah. involved. Um, 2000 and 2000 built. And, and so I just sort of, you know, in, introduced people at the time and they went off and did it. And I think I, 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 want, I wanted to raise $500,000, but it was a cold shower. And I, went, I remember approaching 50 different people. And I think only three people invested and I got like 150 G's and it was just such a cold shower of like, even I'd started my podcast, even I'd started this whole journey, I didn't have enough, a big enough audience to go and do, you know, raise a ton of money. So I had to double down the podcast, I had to double down the brand, but it was a cold shower of just like, when, when you finally have a live deal, you, the, the, how much 
money. Oh, you know, everyone's, everyone's, yeah, I've got money. I'd love to invest with you. When exactly. You, when, you, when you get, when you get a deal, you get a deal. Oh yeah. No, that's yeah, uh, not right now. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> wants to talk, talk a big talk yeah. and say, that, Oh yeah, I'll throw a hundred grand in your, and then it's like, those people go silent when you. Exactly. So <laughs> right. I think the big lesson there is like when you finally do have a live deal, you, you really test how big your network is. And that was a, a cold shower on the network side. So I just doubled down on trying to build that email list and, and grow that, 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 part of the business which i had no idea you know no idea what to do and how to do it yeah. to speak, do what i was doing so yeah so how the next how the next couple deals go that you just were, were a co-gp so so yes slowly that that figure got bigger you know slowly slowly nice. and i think i did end up doing three deals with those guys and then realized that i wanted to be you know i'm an operations guy i, I i'm an under i i built my mousetrap of underwriting um and you know with help of you know using frank's ability you know he was a really good underwriter he's a really good underwriter so took some notes from him and then just started to realize like i need to do my own deals man i need to just to be doing this this is i'm sick of you know playing second fiddle um, right and and so at that point realizing still working full-time had made the transition to the the development company um got uh realized that i was my own bottleneck in my little business and and i was still trying to underwrite deals myself um, from brokers and I'm, I was looking at like 40 to 80 units in Dallas, right? Cause that's where Frank and Joe are now buying deals. And actually Frank was, he, he flicked me on a few, you know, Marcus and Millichap email deals, like smaller deals back in the day. And I was underwriting him. And, and so I, I realized I had to get out of my way. And, and so I went and hired two uh, undergrads at USC um, for like 15 bucks an hour to underwrite deals for me. Um, and that was the first step in systemizing my business in terms nice. of getting out of my own way had built this little mousetrap of underwriting, taught them that, and then they went off and just started underwriting deals. I started getting really close on, I got on sell of you know, best and final calls, um, but still had this issue that I was looking at deals, a lot of deals uh, in that 70 to 150 unit range that I just didn't have the broker relationships with. Um, got mm. very close on a couple. Uh, like so you played Mr. bridesmaid a few times. Yes, played got, bridesmaid a few yeah. times. And that is when I realized I needed someone who's boots on the ground. And that is when I met Andrew Campbell, who's now my business partner at Wildhorn. He had a skill set that was complementary to me. We were comparing notes. We're probably chasing the same deals. He actually had come through Joe as well, um, years after me. Um, and and so it was just more the case of he had he lived in Austin. Um, and you know, he, he just had something that I didn't have, which was boots on the ground. And I needed to build that, that team around me to, in order to be successful. So to this day, I still live in Los Angeles and, and, and you know, it's a, he goes and shakes the tree and I, the lemon tree and I determine if we make lemon juice or lemonade. Wow, <laughs> so that's a great partnership. That's, and that's, yeah. that's, and that's what you need because yeah. complementary skill sets, you need someone. And it was the, the, the element that I was missing, you know, I wasn't going to move to Dallas or Texas. And these brokers are probably like, who the hell is this Aussie guy calling me from LA? You know what I mean? So, but I was, but clearly the evidence was the, the proof was in the pudding that I was getting on best and finals. I was getting bridesmaids, second, third positions, but losing out by just like smidgens, you know, losing out to the Brad Sumrock students and all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. in those sort of markets. So yeah, it, it, it just was a, a lesson that I needed to up my game and, and needed to bring someone on. And, and also it's the spinning plates. Like I was still working, obviously working full time and, underwriting and trying to have a relationship and all that sort of stuff yeah. is it becomes overwhelming a lot yeah absolutely yeah. so so reed i know before we we started the interview here you talked a little bit about one of the books that you co-authored and, and talked about the six p's of capital raising so mm -hmm. you know i don't necessarily want to give away you know all the no, secrets good. in the book but um you know what are those six yeah. p's to capital yeah. raising yeah so the book's called Ten Thousand miles the american dream you can kind of see it in the background here it's a black one it's i co-authored it with uh and this is another thing for example guys i'm, I'm going to go off a little bit of a tangent on the story of the book just for 30 seconds through my podcast investing in the us which is you know the first book um i'd interviewed these aussies uh and and, and and from there you know entrepreneurship can be lonely and what i did about four or five years ago really when I made that transition into LA had started doing the podcast was like, let's, I met all these guys and I wrote an email. I was like, guys, let's just have a month, once a month call. Let's, let's just have a mask. We're all out here. We're all Aussies. We're all clearly trying to get, you know, established businesses through real estate investing, especially us real estate investing. Let's start there. We started there, met up a couple of times. And then like a couple of years later, like let's write a book. And then now the book was launched in July 
we're all a co we all got uh, different chapters and everyone's got a different journey and slightly different takes on their, their journey, but all with the same underlying premise that we'd all had achieved or were achieving financial freedom through investing in US real estate. So that's the backstory. Oh, that's I cool. It. I say that because I just, again, went out and created something that I needed and I went out and created a mastermind in order for me to feel self, self satisfied. Right. bouncing ideas of one of other people they didn't pay a dime for it It was just like hey guys let's get on a call once a month and everyone was in because everyone was having the same struggles right um so that that's the backstory and, and I, I say it so we, if- we were just talking about i mean not to go on another tangent yeah. but but on the whole mastermind thing those are so powerful brandon mm-hmm. myself his dad and our two other partners were talking about that over the weekend and it's just such a powerful thing to get like-minded individuals you know in the same room or, or on the same zoom call yep. and yep. just hash things out bounce ideas i mean that that's 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 awesome that's and it goes back to that adage of you you, you surround yourself with you're the average of five people you surround yourself yeah, with you just five people you surround yourself with and so we all elevated our games and we created this book and so yeah my chapter is on it's called the, uh, the art and science of raising capital like a pro the six p rule and it started with four p's and i had two p's extra p's and actually when i was in the engineering um uh job i created the first four p's which was really an observation of people like joe fell as people like you know successful people raising capital and just the the ability to go out and do it and how do you do it right for, for your business and and the first p is is professionalism and professionalism is is really goes to the point of like, we're not all born out of the womb with 15 years worth of real estate experience. Everyone has to start from, from scratch. Everyone has a journey. Everyone has skill sets that they're brought from, whether it be you're a tradie or a welder, to all the way through to an accountant, all the way through to myself as an engineer. Learn, leaning on those skills and you can be valuable to someone, understanding that you're standing on a mountain of value, that you do have value that you can offer to someone else. And so that professionalism P, the first one is that take yourself as a professional. You are a brand, you are a business, and that's how you're going to go out and start raising capital successfully. So that's the first P. Second P is, is pitch all around about creating uh, an elevator pitch all around creating uh, how do you go from a social setting into more of a meeting setting? You know, how do you meet someone at a, at a, at a networking event and like, how mm-hmm. do you take them away and let's go meet for coffee and, and really understand, or yeah, yeah. And, and really understand that a pitch is not a pitch. It's a, um, it's a start of a conversation, right? No one says, "Oh, that was a great pitch." They say it was a start of a really good conversation, right? Right. And you know, the the, the adage that I use, and, and I've used it, many other people have used this, is the Martin Luther King's you know speech. He, he didn't get on the Washington Monument through pitching it once. He did it thousands of yeah. times and thousands and thousands of times. And so that is a example of like. You got to do it. Your first, your one one pitch is not going to do it. You got to do it a thousand times to get to a meeting pitch, to get to like a sales pitch where you can build rapport with someone, present them, you know, information. And, and in in that pitch, we talk about pitch deck and having a pitch deck and, and presenting it. You know, for an overview of what you do and how you can have hypothetical examples of real estate deals to get people to right, like a sample up. deal or something. Sample deal. That's yeah. correct. Yep. And then from that, it's the practice, which is the, the, the schedule pitch. You got to practice, 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 get in front of people, get them, I, I, I understand, you know, who, who's going to be in your network that's going to give, raise money. And you really start with your phone and your Facebook group, you know, Facebook friends, your mom and dad's friends and asking people and, 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 sched, and, and practicing it as much as you can, getting to networking events um, and just practice, 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 that thousand pitch idea. Um, from there, it's creating a platform online of how to d- d- deliver your message across across the, the globe. And, and for me, it was, um, sorry, your profile online. So people are going to Google you and got to make sure you've got to have a really good profile, good website, good, you know, good headshots, good content. And, and that leads into the platform pitch. You know, how, how do you, what platform do you want to use in term, terms of getting your message out there? Is it a, a monthly newsletter? Is it a podcast like we're on right now? Is it a book? Um, is it video? You know, what, whatever you choose is, it, you know, blogging, is it, you need to be good at it or not good at it, but you need to, have something that resonates with you and do it consistently and something a low hanging fruit is a, a monthly email that you can start through developing your, your, your email database. Mm-hmm. But you know, the other end of it could be, you know, Gary V has, uh, you know, Gary v has these YouTube channels and videos where he's got a whole freaking team following him around. Like there's, yeah. there's, there's different ends of the spectrum and there's all yeah. things in the middle. And for me, when I started my podcast back in 2014, it was like, I was just struggling with, stuff about being an expat buying deals here in the united states look online on itunes there was no one talking to the international investor well i niche till it hurts i niche that i had a weird voice and 
had an accent and, and so other people would find that valuable. And through that, I've pivoted the podcast to be more inclusive of everything involved in real estate investing and, and investing in general. Um, so that I chose my platform. I wasn't, I don't like writing. I don't like videos can be t- sometimes tough, but the audio part of it was really, really powerful for me. Wow. Um, and so, and then, then, then what's that was a platform profile. And then the last P is patience. This, mm-hmm. this takes lots time. of it. Yes. Lots of it. And that, you know, people quit because at things, because they don't have the right mindset on the front end and people are, you know, out there banging these drums of, Oh, you're going to get financially free in six months. Like that's a lot of bullshit. You're not going to get financially free in six months. It might take you 10 years. Again, right. I took me eight years or seven years to get, you know, between picking up rich dad, poor dad and actually getting financially free. It was probably eight and a half years. Wow. So it takes time. And if I was to give up at any time along that journey, I would not be here sitting with you boys today talking about what I've been doing. So the patience part is super important. And, and I think the, the, the two, the professionals and the patients, allowing yourself to know that you're standing a mountain of value, allowing, knowing that you, everyone's got to start it somewhere. Everyone has to start somewhere and it's going to take time are the two most important P's, but they're, they're, they're the six P's. Wow. That was, that was gold right there. Anybody out there that's listening that wants to get into multifamily, do uh, you know, raise money, get into some syndications. I would write all that down and, and just dive or, or into get, it. Grab his book because he goes you're into, driving, in, in the book. Yeah, yeah. if you're driving, don't write it down. Wait until you're parked. But <laughs> <laughs> that was gold. Well, well, now they have those little Amazon things you can plug into your car. You can probably just tell Alexa to buy, <laughs> yeah, buy right. the book or whatever. So, yeah. that's, cool. that's right. That's right. Well, that's all. That's incredible. Um, so to, so can, you, can you explain just, just what, what – uh, you mentioned that you're working on a deal as we speak. Tell us just, let's dive into that one a little bit, as much as you can, as much information sure. as you can share, just how you found yeah. it, all, all that. Yeah. So I, uh, the backstory is now like today we have about 1800 units um, uh, in our port. That's, that's excluding the stuff I did with Joe and Frank early. Wow. I, I don't even really count that anymore. That's not even on the website. How many but deals does that did, make up? That's eight, eight deals. Eight, okay. Um, wow. So those are big deals. 170 million, 75 million under management. With this new deal, it's going to be over 200 at the in March, That's and crazy. we'll be. I think we'll be just or just under or just over 2,000 units when this deal shuts closes. Um, wow. So yeah, the, we're we're in Austin, San Antonio. Um, we're we're really hyper focused on Austin. We've got about 1,000 units in San Antonio and about 800 in Austin. Soon to be a thousand in Austin. Um, the way it came about, this is the this deal specifically is the lowest cash flowing deal we've ever put out. However, it is in the belly of the beast when it comes to Austin development. And our thesis is today is that Austin has has had a um, a conscious change over the last twenty years, and we know this to be to be fact that it was a boom and bust town many many years ago. Um, people are like, oh my god, Austin's so booming right now. I compare Austin now to a coastal city. It is, has mass, it has very high barriers to entry for new product. It takes two to three years to get entitled in the city at Austin. So very similar to Los wow. Angeles, very similar to San Francisco, very similar to, to New York. And, and these places in, in New York and San Francisco are low cap rates, historically low cap rates, will consistently be low cap rates because demand is higher than supply. When a, t- when a town like Austin is transitioning like this, and again, it's been conscious growth that the city has, want, has invested billions of dollars over the last 20 years into an economic development board that has another 25 year tail that we're sitting here today in 2020 going, wow, look, look how cool Austin is. It was a conscious decision back in the nineties to invest in the town, to make it not so boom and bust. So when you have high barriers to entry, you, your existing product, your supply is very limited. Your demand is going through the roof, jobs, 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 jobs. That is when you double down knowing that, you know, we are, we've, we've bought a deal right in the belly of the beast. It's across the road from a, 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 a new project called Project Catalyst, where they're taking 600 units offline to build a million square feet of retail for Oracle, or office and retail. So wow. when you know stuff like that, looking at the existing multifamily deal, and I had to underwrite it from like an existing multifamily deal and presented it as the facts, but it's got all these other elements to it. Now everyone says, oh, you got you got to underwrite on the actuals. So guys, wake up. We're not in that fucking world anymore. Right. We are, the last 10 years are going to be so different from the, from the next 10 years. If you aren't keeping up with how deals are evolving and what makes a deal a deal, the, and your expectations of returns are, are not changing along with that, 
Like I come from a country where if you double your money in 10 years, you're doing really freaking well. We've wow. been spoiled. We've been spoiled since 2009 where people have doubled, tripled their money in three to five years. We're not in that, we're not in that market anymore. We're starting to slow down. We're starting to mm -hmm. not slow down. We're just starting to taper off. You can't keep going at 45 degree yeah, angles. That's right. And so when you understand the barriers to entry, the supply and demand chain and what things are happening in and around cities, you're going to do just fine over the long term. And changing investors' mindset, like, oh, it doesn't cash flow 7% out of the gate? Show me a deal that ever did, right? right and so, yeah. you know, having those conversations with investors, having those um, educated decisions that, guys, if me paying you a 7% pref on your money on $100,000, does seven grand really move the needle for you every year? Or does the fact that if you give me $100,000 and I give you it back in six years' time with $250,000, is that what's going to move the needle? Yeah, no, that's, I totally agree with that. That's where we are, right? And that's as syndicators where we have to be educating our investors about what's happening and what is constitutes a good deal these days. And some, and that's where we're switching from more retail investors into more institutional investors because institutional investors they love a twelve percent IRR. They freaking do that all day long. Right. Mm -hmm. your, your average retail investor goes, "Well, that's a bad deal. Where's my seventeen percent?" Like. Show me a seventeen percent. I'll show you. Right. You know what I mean. It'll be a so, D-class property in the hood. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. So again, you're 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 buying for us because when a slowdown happens, those D-class neighborhoods are going to get even worse. Yeah. And we're in that we're in that B B plus where you know even in a slowdown, class A renters come into class B, class B goes to class C, class C goes to class D. So, so you're not. You're you're not operating like a like a lot of people are and saying, oh, deals are tough to come by. Let's let's just hang tight for a few years, see what happens in the market. You're like you're bullish, and you you well, we're bullish bullish in the right way. Like we got this deal off market. We didn't get it by any means a steal, but on a price per square foot of what other things are trading for for new class A development, we got it below what other things are trading for on the dirt. So. And, and you and, knew that because of your prior experience, whereas well, like, and, and we were competing. Just, yeah. just, just ask the questions, right? Just understand where it's going, where people just look so, they're so scattered across the country. We're not trying to find deals all over the place. It's like, well, double down in your market and, 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 and understand why the market is changing that way in order to be more sophisticated about the deals that you are seeing. And, and like the developers that I've seen, that I've worked with in LA, They've been investing in LA for 20, 30 years and they'll continue to invest in LA. Right. You know, they're not, it's, again, you've never heard of these guys, but they're continuing to invest in a market that has a massive supply and demand issue. Right. And, they'll, and, they'll, they'll, and, and the one thing I remember from, from Cam Baboff, who was the, the CEO of Ensemble Real Estate Investments, you can look him up in Long Beach. He's like, time is on, if time is on your side, you're going to do just fine. And that's where we've got to change investors' expectation. They're thinking, oh my God, I need the money now. I was like, do you need the money now or do you right. need the money when we double it for you in five years time or six years yeah. time? And, 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 and it's a lower risk deal because of all these other factors that are going on. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah I, I'd much rather uh, wait that five years and you know, it, it's not all, defer. it's not pretty that way. Cause you know, you can't just sit there and say I'm rolling in cash, but right. You know, but who at is? That five year, <laughs> right. Who, who, right. Who is, if you want a cash flowing deal, go buy a business. Yes. Real estate is not, as cash flowing as everyone making it out to be, you know, it's right. not just these cap rates of 10% and you know, you just, you know, you get interest rates at 4%. Yeah. You're getting interest rates at 4% and you're going to be buying at five, five and a half percent. There's a small, there's a small Delta there. So there's yeah. cash flow limited. Yeah. So, and it goes, it goes back to your, your last P patience, you know, patience on syndicators end and patience on the best investors end. Yeah, you know, right. everybody's going to have that patience for, for this stuff to work out. Exactly. That's right. Well, we'll read. What are what are some things that you're aside from this deal? What are some things that you're excited about and and and, and working towards in the future? Uh, look, the the big thing I'm I'm working towards in the future, like for the for the better part of the decade, the North Star was financial freedom, financial freedom, financial freedom, financial freedom. It's now what's my new North Star? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and so it, it's it. You know, we work with my business coach, um, my life coach as well. And again, to that point of coaches before. I don't have a, I have a business slash life coach. It's got nothing to do with real estate. It's got everything to do with building culture, building me as a better human, you know, being more self-aware, understanding that the, the pillars of the table, business is just one of them. Where, right. where are you on self-awareness? Where are you on your health? Where are you on your relationships and love? And so 
and I say it's a bit, a bit woo woo, but it's like more to understand that you see so many guys that are successful in, in business, they have shit lives, they've got four divorces, right. the kids hate them and the hell's up the creek, right? And so being a little bit more, uh, you know, understanding of all that, all, of what makes what life work. Yeah, well-rounded. <laughs> well-rounded. You, you can be humble, you can be grounded and you don't have to always have that freaking social media anxiety. Like, what am I doing next? You know what I mean? So yeah. really for us, it's, 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 we want to double the portfolio in the next uh, two, three years. Uh, we want to obviously create um, a mass amount of value for our investors, doubling down on, on true growth markets. We're looking at a brand spanking new uh, opportunity zone deal that has got n no retail investor will see this deal. And we're, we're, we're partnering with institution, institutional guys. Our last deal, we just partnered with one, one investor who bought $7 million to the table. And he's like, I just want to get into 10 IRR over 10 years. He's like, oh, it was a 1031. So like wow. the, the way in which, and we, you know, we, you, you get your first 2000 deals with your retail investors, you get to five, 6,000 units through institutional partners. And that's yeah. really where we're headed for in the next, you know, um, three to five years. Wow. Also looking at deals back in Australia. Um, I want to, I want to do deals back in Aussie, given that the American, I'll start cycling deals here. Um, and I want to double down the podcast, loving the, the thought leadership platform stuff that we're trying to develop and, and just really have a really good life. I think I that's, love that. Yeah, that's, that's so, exciting. Sounds like you're well on your way to double in your portfolio and do all the stuff goals. you just mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. That's huge. So I love well, that. We, we're going to jump into our moments of truth segment here. It's the same awesome. seven questions that we ask all of our guests. And the first one is who is your success role model? Ooh. That's a good, that's probably the harder one. I, I, when you said to me the quote earlier, I was like, I, 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 yeah, yeah, we <laughs> uh, Who's my success role model? Like, obviously, I, I spoke, I've quoted uh, Tony Robbins a few times here. Um, I, I do, it evolves all the time. I, I love the down to earth, foul mouth Gary Vee. You know, you, know, you know, it wasn't at the beginning. Obviously, really early on was Robert Kiyosaki. Um, it, it evolves over time as, as, as you, as, as we as humans evolve. So, a couple of names there, Gary V, Robert Kiyosaki, and, and Tony Robbins. Who, who would you say it is right now in your current? Uh, I think Gary. Right Gary, Gary okay. terms of, he, just because he's out there so much, you see him a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, I do love him. You know, I'm a bit of a, I can be a bit of a foul mouth sailor at times just because I'm Australian. Um, but, I, <laughs> but I do love he's just, he's straight to the point. No BS. Like, yeah. He's not sugarcoating it at all. That's what I love about it. Like, it's just real answers. And he's like, yeah, dude, you, 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 you're stuffing up, you know. You, Pull up your socks and get going. <laughs> yeah, that's very <laughs> true. true. Uh, he doesn't mince words. No, it doesn't yeah. mince words exactly. Yeah, yeah that's right. Uh, what's your biggest success? Um, getting on, stepping on that plane, moving from yeah. Australia to yeah. the United States. That's that's been yeah. It, that's what it sounds like. I mean, that that was your first step to to creating everything you've got back, right now. Back, yeah, it sounds corny. It's like the 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 what is, what is it? Climbing up a mount, mountain. It yeah. all starts with one step, something like that. It does. It, it, and, and now, yeah. but also having the self awareness to enjoy the journey. You know, it's mm -hmm. not a race to the top. What, what are you gonna do when you the top? <laughs> right. Yeah. You know what I mean. So enjoy it while you can. Yeah, that's awesome. What's a typical day for you look like? Typical day, uh, wake up about quarter to seven, seven o'clock, uh, try and have the first hour of no phones, take the dog for a walk. I do some deep breathing exercises, um, then get into, you know, about eight, eight thirty, get into the, into the, into the, into the work day. Usually the first four hours of the day are, are pretty effective. Um, and then the afternoons are spent, you know, either going to the gym, um, or, or, or with meetings, which I don't have to be as effective on, you know, not that it's not going to the gym, it's not effective or going to meetings, but it's just like, you don't have to be as on, uh, like right. you do. you've got to deal with your, deal with your, your stuff in the morning and the afternoons are, are sort of right. spent or, you know, I, I break my time up into black time, blue time, red time, and black time and sort of meetings and podcasts and this sort of stuff. Blue time's a little bit more of the manufacturing, you know, getting the, getting, how's the business going, sort of yeah. speaking. And red time, I don't do any red time, which is admin, but I check in, I oversee that just to make sure it's, it's going well. Okay. So, that's yeah. awesome. That's, that's pretty unique. I've, I've never heard anybody uh, okay. block it into kind of colors. Yeah, yeah, I think you have to because yeah. Black, yeah, time, black and blue time, uh, uh, you know, think of a black time as you're, you're the CEO, you're the, you're, the, you're, the, you're the captain of the ship. That's what's going to get the inspirational stuff. It's think about the next book. It's thinking mm -hmm. about high level next, stuff, you know, yeah. high level stuff. And you should be, you know, in an ideal world, you should be spending 60 or 70 percent of your time in that level, right? right you don't, yeah. shouldn't be spending it in emails. Blue time is emails, is, you know, asset management, is underwriting, is, you know, stuff that keeps the business going. It moves the needle, but you have less enjoyment for, so you outsource that. 
and or if you best you can and then red stuff is obviously doesn't really move the needle but needs to be done um, right right at least enjoyment so yeah yeah that's, that's good i love that what's your favorite quote that's from my dad uh, he always he always said to me a fool and their money are easily parted uh mm-hmm. and it comes back to the education piece don't be a fool with your money uh, he's a he, he's a high school teacher, and he's he now he's now sixty three. He owns his own house outright. Uh, he's retired. He's got a great you know he's done he's done the sort of more corporate worldish way, but yeah, he always invested in real estate, and 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 always we we never we went without things growing up, but also we very had from very humble beginnings, and now he's you know he's always just he's never been a fool with his money. Mm. The, the the little money that he had as being a teacher as, as for the last thirty five years. So, so that's yeah. great. Has he ever yeah. invested in one of your deals? Yeah, well, he was in that that flip. <laughs> oh, oh, that's right, that's right. Yeah, yeah. That flip. So, Very cool. Early on in the piece. So. Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, and, and I don't know why this popped up, but Grant Cardone has this one saying: "Is is bored money is spent money." And mm-hmm. he, he's talking about money just sitting in like a savings account. You know, it, you could save up all this money, but you you know that one day you, you see that car that you want or something like that, and you're like, "Well, I do have twenty grand in my savings account. You know, could go to this. <laughs> it's just bored money sitting there, right. and it's going to get spent eventually right. if you don't put exactly. it in something to, to make exactly. it up." Hundred percent. So, uh, what are some of your hobbies? I uh, love surfing. Surfing is probably my biggest hobby. Uh, I, I, it's a uh, if I can get once a week and do it, particularly in the winter here where the swell's bigger. Uh, I just got myself a new board around Thanksgiving and I've been riding that, riding that thing uh, a lot. Um, yeah, I really, really, really love surfing. My sort of peaceful state is, 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 is looking at the, you know, you see those GoPro cameras where the, the wave is peeling yeah. up. Yeah. yeah. That, that to me is what I go to for a peace of mind. If it, That's if, like your meditation. Yes, exactly. That's, awesome. That's cool. I, I love surfing. Yeah, no, is, a, is the water cold? I mean, oh, yeah, freezing. I yeah, yeah, I, I, okay. I wear a four three wetsuit, and yeah. uh, oh, wow. I, it's it's yeah, you you, don't, you can't feel your hands or your toes when you get out. But it's, I tell <laughs> it's you what, it's, but it's worth it. it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Uh, what, what what is the best business book that you've read? Uh, I'll give you two. Um, obviously, Rich Dad Poor Dad. Yeah, really inspir- inspiration. We spoke a lot about on the show. The other really awesome business book is by an. Uh, a little bit around the pitching stuff that I've, I've sort of lent on a little bit is uh, Daniel Priestley. He's an Australian author. He wrote the book, Key Person of Influence. Uh, he also wrote 24 Assets and Entrepreneur Revolution. Has nothing to do with real estate, but it's got everything to do with how do you create the mindset of being that key person of influence in your sphere, personal branding, um, in order to go out and you know be an influence. You don't have to be Gary Vee or Tony Robbins, but you mm-hmm. can be an influencer in your, sp- in your sphere about what you do in whatever industry you're in. So really, really cool. that's, that sounds yeah. like a pretty important book to read, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. You should, yeah, everyone should definitely read it. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So last question here, Reed, if there's one key piece of advice you could leave our listeners with about achieving success, what do you think it would be? Uh, well, I think it boils down to three. One is education. The foot that, you know, ignorance is, is not, is not an excuse anymore. Get educated. Take it from me. The United States has a great in infrastructure of education, particularly in and around real estate in many major cities around the country with the REAs and the meetup groups, go start there. I bet you, if you commit to going there, you know, two or three times a month for the next 12 months, you're going to be known around the traps pretty well. Get a mentor is, is really important and have the, have the patience and the persistence to know that it's going to take some time to get to the where you, anything worth building is going to take time. There's yeah, no such thing as quick. Definitely. Time. So yeah. Yeah. I yeah love that. If it, it comes quick and it goes quick, right? It does. So, easy, uh, easy mean, come, easy go, right? Right. So, yeah, yeah. That's great. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So Reed, how can our uh, listeners get in contact with you and, and the names of your books and podcasts, sure. all that again? Yeah. Um, so the, the, the podcast investing in the U S if you're looking on, on the video, it's, there's a book here. It's I've got investing in the U S has been going for four, four and a half years, 200 episodes. Uh, I interview, I've interviewed you, you obviously got some of you guys, not you, yeah. Brandon, but we'll get you on there. Um, uh, there's that, there's obviously the book, which is all the best episodes from that, uh, podcast into a book form. And that's okay. what just got to number one before Chrissy. And then the second book is 10,000 miles to the American dream. You can find all of that on my website at reedgoosens.com. That's R E E D G O O S S E N S.com. Um, and if you're ever coming through LA, you know, hit me up. I'm always, if, as long as you give me enough time, I'm always willing to meet up for a beer or a coffee just chat, you know, whatever. I love talking shop. So just give me plenty of heads up and I'm willing to, willing to carve some time out of my day. Well, that's okay. awesome. Appreciate yeah. it. Well, Reed, we appreciate you being on the show today. I 
the six P's that you just, you told us, those are awesome. I, I mean, really everything you said was, was great and valuable stuff. So we, we appreciate you being on the show today and sharing your story with our, our listeners. Hey guys, I'm pretty humbled to, to be invited and uh, hopefully I did give your listeners some, and you guys some, some, some little oh, tips. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, to be honest, if, if, if no one, no one gets anything I got, I uh, yeah, got same here. So I, that's why <laughs> I, I enjoy <laughs> doing it. Cause right? you know, yeah, they, you, you, I bet you yeah. people like me, you know, like you, you get off these things and you, you're at the same level, right? You just yeah. you start getting amped. And, and, and these podcasts probably act like to you because you're the host as your little mastermind, right? Oh, does, 100%. Yeah. I, mean, I leave yeah. these. I'm like, why did I never think of that? <laughs> yeah. I sometimes leave these things and my wife's like, did you just take drugs? <laughs> yeah. Like, no, I'm, I'm, on that, I'm on that same energy level as you do. Exactly. Yeah. You're like on a high it's from it. No, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. But thanks a lot, guys. I really appreciate yeah. it. Well, thank you, Reed. And yeah. we'll see everybody tomorrow.